Okay, so that's our introductory stuff. Now we're going to uh, introduce our featured speaker. Oh, that's me. Okay. My name is Jack Shimmick, and I've been a student of agorism for as, lo as, as early as Sam Konkin invented the philosophy. So um, my topic today, though, is called Justice and the Sequence Question. So, like I was telling Gavin here, I made that intentionally intriguing so he would come and hear. So, I think, just to sort of define the scope of the discussion, I think that libertarians are, um, they're, they're in agreement on the non-aggression principle. So that's the fundamental principle. And then you have to derive everything from there. So there's different applications of that principle. And uh, so a lot of people have figured out how you apply that to, like you have a trespasser on your property, et cetera, et cetera. The, the simple questions. But I think in the, uh, in the real world, there's some much more complicated questions. And I call these the big questions because um, a lot of libertarians are still fighting over these big questions. So here's an example of some of the big questions. And then when I get to the sequence question, I'm proposing that as another big question. Abortion. Um, people are arguing about life and when does life begin and who has the right to life and who doesn't. And there was a group, and I'm not sure they're still active, uh, called Libertarians for Life. So that group argues libertarian principles and how they apply to, you know, early stage life. And to me the question is when do you decide that the person acquires rights if you've got this principle that you have a right to live uh, without someone killing you. I don't want to start that question now, but I think everybody will agree it's still a big question kind of issue. The one I throw in is the nuclear question. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a lot of scientific engineering types in the libertarian movement, and they'll say, oh yeah, nuclear power, it can be safe, it's just that the government has screwed it up. Um, but the nuclear question for libertarians is, if we believe in protecting other people's rights, um, when is it when is it proper to develop some technology that's going to have possible effect on people's rights for the next 700,000 years or whatever the number you want to use it's like a, an enormous number and what happens right now is the nuclear industry is run by all state actors with private or corp big corporate subcontractors but in the end, the state actors are non-responsible. They're not... Uh, the, the biggest, most destructive ways nuclear power has been used is in acts of war. And, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but, you know, let's say half a million is a number. The people in Japan were killed in the period of a week. And state actors essentially claim non-responsibility for deaths in time of war. So it's a, it's a way to become non-responsible. You just, like leave all morality behind and just commit acts of war and kill people wholesale. Um, and the third thing about the nuclear question for libertarians is that the uh, there's a legislated cap on the liability. In other words, they wanted to do peaceful uses of the atom, they called it, so they wanted to have nuclear power plants. And what happened is in the early 50s, nobody would insure them, so the industry wasn't going to go forward until Congress passed an act, I forget the name of it, it was a hyphenated act, Anderson something act. And they said, okay, the insurance companies only have to cover the liability up to this point, and then the government will assume the rest of the liability. I think it's Price Anderson. Price Anderson, okay. So anyway, a nuclear question is one, in, so just I'll throw out my personal opinion, is I think the nuclear industry, which includes peaceful and wartime use, is an international criminal uh, conspiracy, essentially. They, they experiment on people and kill them with slow deaths from cancer. They blow the people up in Japan, etc., etc. They, they create this huge unfunded liability with all the nuclear waste. And if I talk any more about that, I'll use up too much time. But other big libertarian movement questions are the voting question. So we have, you know, a whole bunch of people that believe it's moral to vote and essentially give your your proxy on the use of force to someone else who's non-responsible, you know, Congress and the cops, basically. Um, and it 
delegates our moral authority to others and it removes us from responsibility. So I'm an anti-voter, non-voter anti-voter, but obviously I'm not in the, the dominant position necessarily in the movement. Uh, other big questions that have come up in the libertarian movement is the use of force. There's this big fracas right now because Chris Cantwell wants to talk about the use of force and the FSP Inc. doesn't want to at an event. Um, big questions, pollution. You know, um, it seems like uh, other people are concerned about pollution and, and again, kind of the sciencey or scientific uh, libertarians, some of them will support the big corporations and say, oh, the pollution regulations are too strangling to industry, blah, blah, blah. I'll leave it at that. It's another big question. The roads. What about the roads? And the question is more broadly about the commons. Like, if we did sell off all the roads, you know, and then privatized them, and now corporations owned all the roads, uh, you might be back to almost like this feudal system where you couldn't travel from your property to another property because you didn't have a right to use the roads. Some of these issues were like fought out, you know, back in 1215 with Magna Carta and other things, but I think libertarians need to uh, look at some of the big questions in a, a new creative way. So the other thing in the title of the talk is justice, and then we'll get to the sequence question I want to throw out as another big question for the movement. Libertarians, I think, are driven by a quest for justice, or the corollary is they're actually outraged by a lot of the injustice, and they want to do something about it. So there's a big drive for justice, although libertarians don't talk about it as much as, say, some of the progressives when they talk about social justice. But like I think everybody else innately has a drive for justice, or an outrage at injustice. But... I believe the state uses uh, propaganda to manage public information in such a way that they end up uh, actually managing the w what things people are outraged about. And they also use synthetic events, false flag operations, they tie that in with propaganda. And so they can, they can manage to get people outraged at all Muslims, let's say, so that the average guy will say, yeah, we should go over there and nuke those ragheads. And, and feel somehow morally justified. And if it were actually a synthetic event done by some white Christian guys in, you know, in a secret ops thing, there'd be a horrible injustice done. But anyway, the state does uh, manufacture consent by their use of the media. So justice, we're still concerned about justice and we're driven by that, it's like a, a gut urge. So. If we're to figure out a transition from where we are today with a lot of injustice and get to a freer society, somehow in the transition we don't want to create any more injustice. We don't want to make things worse for some people along the way. And the perception, for example, of the social democrats is that, oh, libertarians just want to eliminate the welfare system and all the poor people will starve. So that would be, in their mind, unjust. And uh, so I don't think a transition should create more injustice. I don't want to go on into that issue more, but... Uh, so now the sequence question. What do I mean by the sequence question? If you were to be able to dismantle the state, uh, in what sequence would you do it that would result in the most justice? or the least injustice, let's say. So that's kind of the short frame of the question. And then I'm gonna throw out a couple of people that have approached that issue. Uh, I think Rothbard was asked, um, and I can't remember by whom, but if there was one button that he could push that would say, okay, we'll end the state today, would he push that button? And he says, yes, of course. So even though that's interesting and funny and all that, it's not realistic. He doesn't have that power or that choice, and neither do we. Um, so what are the questions for us? What's going to be more realistic? We don't have that power. We're all like, uh, have a reasonable small sphere of power. So the choices that are realistic for us, like, you hear this a lot in the libertarian movement. Yeah, we should dismantle this department and do this, but that's not within our power to do. The the things that we have power to do are things like 
carrying signs, you know, donating money to a campaign, whether it's political or otherwise. Uh, we have power to argue on the internet, you know, things like that. But that's essentially trying to persuade people. So we have, we have essentially um, a much smaller choice to make rather than change the whole world. No, we're going to do some action today. And what we have to give to the movement essentially is uh, three, three main things. Time, money, and energy. And so all of us here have decided to commit some of our time, money, and energy just by coming to Porkfest, for example. And then a lot of us will go away, away from here and be involved in some other campaign or donate to this, that, and the other. But it's all just these three basic assets, time, money, and energy. Now when you get to the real high level of the power structure, you can take people like the Rockefellers, for example. They have way more money, and with their money, they can buy the time and energy of a bunch of other people by employing them. And they can also use it for lobbyists to get the Congress to do things their way. But they do things like create whole institutions, you know, if they want to influence public opinion. Uh, the real ruling class, uh, wealthy like that, have created things that affect, uh, like the Carnegie Institute uh, created. Uh, one of them created actually the NEA, the Teachers Union now, but it was actually an association before to influence how things were taught. Uh, the American History Association, things like that, they work on what history we're able to know, essentially. So they influence things at a huge, huge level. And so, you know, they have essentially the same thing we have, they just have a whole lot more of it. Um, and what that illustrates is even they, if they wanted to change the system to a complete fascist state, they don't have enough power either to just push a button and make that happen. They have to spend tens of millions of dollars creating institutes, hiring intellectuals, getting them trained and placed in universities, and blah, blah, blah. And they have essentially a masterful system of manipulating the whole society, but they don't have enough power to accomplish it overnight by pushing a button either. They're essentially exercising their time, money, and energy. So, since we've decided to spend our time, money, and energy, some of it, you know, because basically uh, you could probably look at it as I want to allocate X number of hours of time and X amount of money, and hopefully we keep up our energy and enthusiasm for it that we continue this. But we have to consider if we're spending it effectively and if we're uh, causing things to happen in a just way. And I'll give you now some examples, and I think if you consider this sequence question, You'll, you'll think of some examples of your own. So for example, the tax system is ostensibly a system to gather money to pay for stuff. So they always argue that, oh, if you don't pay taxes, who's going to pay for the roads, school, city hall, salaries of the guys that repair you know, the roads or the parks. So somebody has to pay for it. You're not paying your fair share. So Yes, if you were using something, it would be fair for you to pay for it. That would be just. Fairness is just a, a term to refer to what, what we consider to be a just outcome of something. So, um, so with the tax system, the legislative struggle, ostensibly, they'll argue, is a, they're struggling to make it fair so that you pay your fair share. All this is about people's concept of justice. Um, but actually the real struggle is essentially um, the people with the most influence are trying to make the system unfair or skewed in their favor. So, you know, they want to get this clause inserted into Internal Revenue Code to cause this, this, and this. And I'm not going to go into specifics because that would take like days. So, um, you know, if, for example, if you don't like smoking and you think uh, smokers should be penalized, blah, 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 and that they're causing uh, damage to society and that they're causing health care costs to rise because it's a socialized health system or whatever, then you think it's fair that they pay their fair share by pay paying a higher cigarette tax. So, you, so the legislative struggle over uh, tax policy is about trying to make it skewed in one way or another, but in the name of fairness, you know, the PR. So... 
if you were to dismantle, for example, the onerous tax system, and it's already inherently skewed, you would want to dismantle it in a sequence that avoided unfairness to one group or another. So, for example, um, this is how I think some conservatives may have gotten it wrong. Like, Bush comes in, I don't even know the details of his tax, but he came up with some tax reduction. And the progressives argued that it reduced taxes on the rich, and therefore it's, it, the purpose of it was to skew the system so a certain class benefited over another. Um, but a conservative could argue, I'll take any tax cut that there is. So they can be arguing that they're a pro-freedom position, reduce taxes, but because it's skewed or the, or the policy that was proposed would skew it in favor of one class or another, it's not really pro-freedom. It's Generally, I'm going to assume that the, that the ruling class usually wins these struggles because they have more money for lobbyists and stuff like that. So to dismantle the tax structure, you do it uh, in some other sequence. I'm not going to solve this question, but I'm posing this question to consider when you choose actions. So another example would be, say, a company is a polluter and they are going to spend some of their time, money, and energy trying to affect legislation. So they might say, yeah, this EPA regulation is, is onerous, it's uh, hurtful to industry, blah, blah, blah. We need to re remove the EPA regulation. And of course, they're the worst polluter, so it benefits them. It actually skews things again. And some libertarians and conservatives would be tricked into saying, yeah, we need less regulation. But what happens is because you're removing regulation in just a narrow area that benefits this one group, it doesn't really result in more justice in the end. And also because we probably don't really have any effective other way to deal with polluters. So I was thinking of the Koch brothers when I said that. I was just wondering if anybody else got it. Um, so, so when, when a company funds a campaign and they use uh, pro-freedom rhetoric, I think it's worth you know taking a second look. Are they trying to actually just tweak the sequence of how things are, how the state's dismantled, so it's dismantled in their favor? You can think of lots more examples, and we can have a discussion about that. But that, that I think, is the core of the question, the sequence question. And that's all I've prepared. So let's see what if you guys have any ideas on that. Rich, hand up. Well, I'm just reminded about our ballot measures in Massachusetts in 2002, 2008, and 2010. Two of them were to end the income tax. One of them was to cut the sales tax in half. But also we had a ballot measure to end, you know, decriminalize marijuana in uh, 2008, which won. And I looked at all of those as button pushings. You know, presenting to the public, would you push this button, yes or no? So I think ballot measures are kind of the way to go if you have that the button pushing mentality. I mean, because you mentioned both the sales tax and the income tax, um, some would argue, you know, that the sales tax is more fair because it only taxes people that spend money, and so it distributes it distributes it across the people that pay more money, and that the property tax, for example, hurts people that, that are retired and own property and don't have any more income and don't spend much. And so they all affect different people different ways. I mean, I think that's why people would argue for, say, uh, uh, a flat tax or a sales tax. They're actually trying to figure out a way to make it fairer. You know, so that's good, but libertarians are against taxes. So if we were to... Um, oh, and actually there's a little historical work that should be done on the word tax. Um, I was in a lawsuit one time, and the the lawyer, um, because we won, he submitted another motion to the court for what's called a taxation of costs. And I said, taxation of costs? What does he mean by that? So I looked it up more, and it's really a distribution of the costs among, in this case, the defendants. You know, this one should pay this much and this much and this much. So the thing is that we're not... Uh, against taxation of costs in that sense. In other words, distributing the costs among the people that consume whatever the service is. We're just against compulsory anything, so. 
I have a question then. If user fees are okay, what do you think of the idea of taxing people by how many miles they drive? I think user fees are okay for people to charge users that are voluntary using their service and things like that. I know what you're saying, though, on the roads, would that make it more fair? Like right now, the gas tax is kind of a user's fee. You know, whoever's got a bigger, heavier vehicle and is going to create more wear and tear on the roads, they're probably going to consume more gas, a truck, for example. So, um, and then little old ladies that don't drive, they don't pay any highway tax in that sense. What happened in California, though, was people came out with electric vehicles and so they weren't paying any gas tax, but they were using the roads. So they decided to tax electric vehicles by the mile or something like that. I know it would be more fair. It's not, I'm not trying to support that system, but you do have to, in the, sen the old sense, have a taxation of the costs for the road. In other words, you have to... Well, well, I put that as one of the big questions, the roads or the commons. We have to figure out ways that are really fair to do these things. And it's, I think it's the wrong issue to fight. It's the wrong sequence of things to fight. Oh, this, this is also what I mean by the sequence. So we're going to choose a particular campaign that we're going to be involved in. We're going to spend our time, money, and energy. Would we want to spend it on something that would result in, this, in the sequence that would make things more unjust? Like, do we want to spend our time, money, and energy to reduce the payouts of a welfare system and put the poor people and single mothers out on the street, you know? That's, those aren't the criminals in society. It's the you know the large corporate uh, criminals that are causing these wars. That are you know ripping up the world. So uh, I'm not sure that the state will ever fall in the lifetime of anybody now living. But I think if it does, it might fall like very very suddenly. And uh, the whole sequence question would be kind of irrelevant in, under those circumstances. If you think about it, let's suppose a thousand people could stand up now and say, fuck you bastards, we're never paying any tax again, and get away with it. Like the state would find they're unable to punish them. Pretty soon, every productive person in the country would refuse to pay, and the state would be dead within a week. Now, I'm not saying I have a way to do that, I wish I did, but I don't. But I'm just saying if the state falls suddenly, the whole issue of sequence will be irrelevant. And I think in terms of fairness to everyone, the sudden collapse of the state would actually be way more fair to everybody than any sequence we could hope to like design. It's actually on page 66. Reed Conkin. <laughs> um, yeah, this guy actually proposes a sequence of action, and uh, which is why I like this, because uh, I'll uh, call on you next. The, oh, that's right, you had your hand up first, but then I'll go to him. Um, there's a couple of people who've referred to what people do as random acts of libertarianism, or I call it, yeah, I call it reaction, which is not strategy. Like, they, they decide to fight everything, which everything comes in front of them next. And uh, I think there's some, some PR failures that are happening because of that. Like, um, and I, I try not to publicly criticize other activists, you know, because I know they're all putting their time, money, and energy into this because they care, they're concerned, they're driven. But, for example, there was a group that chalked whatever their message was on the Manchester police station. And the city's response was they have to get the Manchester Fire Department to come over with their hoses and wash off the chalk and that was an expense to the taxpayers and all that. So in the end the PR appearance was that these crazy people that say they believe in not trespassing and destroying other people's property actually destroyed somebody else's property and caused a cost to all the taxpayers to clean up their mess. So that was again a reaction thing. They were they were reacting to some out of control police action. They were protesting it and they were chalking and all that. But the, I don't think they won the PR battle on that. But if you if you compared that to say things like the wars or the the whole military industrial complex or the surveillance state and all that, I think we should figure out which one of those is more important and will give us more freedom to pursue the next thing in the sequence. 
Well, I, I hope this is a relevant question, but uh, you mentioned the commons, and, and um, I was curious as to um, what you uh, what you think about it, the practicality of like common property existing in a stateless society, and if so, how would it be funded? Um, I think it was Roderick T. Long. Uh, I listened to an article. He it was on YouTube. Listened to the audio version. He had different ideas, and I just kind of was curious if. Um, if you're on the privatize everything side, or if you think that things can be commonly owned in a stateless society? I got a couple of short answers. One of them is, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going to end up being most just. But I know things like, you know, the right to travel. When, you know, when serfs were being uh, released from serfdom, and they were previously bound to the land of their lord, the right to travel was like the right to leave that piece of property and go to another. But that almost implied a right of way somehow to get from that owned piece of land to another owned piece of land. So I think for there to be justice, there are some things that are kind of inherently in the commons. So for example, the air. You know, if someone were to try to uh, charge us to breathe the air and privatize the air, I'll take the ridiculous cases or the, or the absurdum cases or extremist cases, whatever. So it's like, I don't think any of us in the room could visualize how that would be fair, you know, for them to charge for us to breathe. And that would kind of like violate the right to live, right to life kind of thing. Then when you get to water, water is more contained. It's either in ponds, rivers, lakes, brooks, things like that. And there are things that people do that came up through common law to essentially say, uh, you know, that you couldn't pollute upstream from somebody who was drinking it or whatever. or. Like in the laws about sewage here, you can't have your um, outhouse closer than 75 feet to somebody else's well where they were going to drink water. And uh, even though the regulations are insensitive, they don't, it's not 75 feet for this guy and 42 feet for that guy because his soil's impermeable and, you know, more. They just throw out one number, 75 feet. So in cases like that, I'll... I'll presume they're trying to do something that's just over the use of the commons, which is, you know, like the underground water it is another commons area. Uh, so the second part of that was, uh, do I believe in privatize everything? No, I think that would result in a, a huge injustice. And the reason I say that is the people that have all the money now uh, have it because of a long-standing uh, stream of events where the, the really wealthy are wealthy now because they completely controlled the state, the banking system, the money system, and they end up with enough money to buy everything. So if you were to say privatize everything, uh, you'd end up, we'd all be serfs again because we don't have enough to buy our own compared to them. Things like the gold standard. Well, the bad guys own 70% of the gold. Do you want them to suddenly own the whole money system? That's why even though gold system sounds good on paper, the starting point today, like it might be, it might be fair if everybody that unjustly acquired the gold through central banking or somehow, if that was somehow restored to everybody else. But that'd be such a difficult justice question. I don't know how you'd resolve that. Um, so I guess there are two issues for me on this. Um, I'm a consensualist, not a minarchist or an anarchist. And um, the idea that there isn't the ability of society to form rules is something I, 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 I find contradiction with. The idea, like you're talking about, the ability to tell people they can't have a common property. You know, that's kind of what's required if you have a truly stateless society. Um, so understanding things like user fees, you know, where you say you can charge for the user fee. Well, you know, you can charge someone on the road who's in commerce, who's selling transportation services, but you can't charge me to operate, you know, a car across that road because it's my property. Yeah, yeah, because of the right to travel, which is a self-evident thing. So I think the first thing before the sequence issue is understanding we're all going to the same goal. You know, is it is it a complete anarchical society or is it a set of rules that we live by in some relationship? And then, <clears throat> I guess my idea for the social justice system is to take social justice out of the legislature and put it into the judicial system. You know, if, if you have a problem with not having enough money, a, se a series of, you know, essential sustenance items, 
you declare bankruptcy, and if you can't get it, then you know you're, you're paid out of the tax fund if you can prove you can't get it. And it moves the government from the first response to poverty to the last response. Because if a charity steps in, then there's no need for the government to act. And one more aspect of what I would see happen is if there's a taxpayer group in the district, the people of the district, they should all get the same thing that this person who couldn't take care of themselves gets because they're all equally affected and damaged in the same way. Anyway, I, I call it social justice with judicial systems. Anyway. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the system of um, judges making some of these decisions to, instead of the legislatures would be evolved law or essentially common law or whatever. Although I've heard some critiques of common law that make me rethink that. But So the natural law theory is that law is discovered and the law that really works we have to discover from nature. It's, it, would, it would sort of come about through many cases and fair judges. So we'd have to also solve the problem of judges being political appointees and basically in New Hampshire a guy told me once he says oh yeah a judge is just a lawyer that knew the governor. You know, so that's how they really get their jobs, you know. There wasn't this careful process of, you know, figuring out who's the fairest guy out there. It's the guy who's been the best buddy of the governor for the longest time. I define natural law as self-evident law, for which there is no contradiction. Natural law is self-evident law, yeah. So none of these things are like a, a scientific solution. They actually have to be worked on and evolved and hammered out by us, the people, you know, we're part of the process. So right now, um, you can march against the legislature. Like we, we go up to, um, when I was more involved actually in the political process, when there was a judgeship appointee uh, in New Hampshire, it has to be approved by the executive council. There's like a, a co-executive of the governor and then there's five council members. So in the council chambers, you could, uh, you could talk against the appointment of a judge, and we did that against a bunch of them. We kept a few from being appointed because we brought out actual evidence. We'd submit them packets of paperwork of what this judge did in this case. And that was literally the people rising up, essentially, you know, uh, opposing, you know, that particular appointment. So it can happen. It's just a whole lot of work, all of this stuff is.